Welcome into Surviving Paradise, the podcast that takes a sometimes serious, oftentimes humorous look at the claim by the leadership of Jehovah's Witnesses that they are living in a modern day spiritual paradise. I'm your host, Stacy Bauman, former elder, ministerial servant, and a little guy that was raised as a Jehovah's Witness throughout the 70s and 80s. Please note, as we do at the beginning of every episode, there's lots of healing here, sarcasm, humor, and more never meant to offend anyone. Simply my own brand of observation in my own experiences. And I have to ask, after being gone for a week and getting back in the saddle, can you feel it? People, we are running out of time in this system of things. The clock is ticking on all of us and everybody else on this planet. There has never been a more important time in all of human history. The governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses assures mankind that the world as we know it is about to end any second now. The most emphasized message to Jehovah's Witnesses is that we are seconds, maybe less than a second away from the great day of Jehovah the Almighty, otherwise known as Armageddon. Can you feel it? From the Watchtower of 1984, November 15th, pages 25 through 26, paragraphs 17 and 18, the article, The Time Left is Reduced. Indeed, it was printed in 1984. We get this, quote, having spiritual discernment, we acknowledge the overwhelming evidence that we have been in the time of the end since 1914. Surely, then, we do not want to use the world to the full as though we would be missing out on something if we did not do so. Rather, let us live our lives with the work of the Lord. Remember that nothing in the present system is permanent, end quote. They continued in the awake of 1990, August 22nd, pages 8 through 9, the meaning of today's news is the article, quote, surely, there's that word again, the evidence abounds that we are living when the coming of God's kingdom and his war of Armageddon are very near. While this vital news has been ignored almost totally by the news channels of the world, Jehovah's Witnesses are sharing and spreading it worldwide. This good news, they tell us, is not only that God will cleanse the earth of all corruption, but that under the rule of his kingdom government, the entire earth will be made into a delightful garden-like paradise, end quote. Yet another, from the awake of 1986, December 8th, pages 8 through 11, who will survive this world's end? That's a question on everyone's mind, undoubtedly. We're told, quote, a time for decision. The time left for this corrupt, violent, unjust world is critically short. And then finally, one more nugget of Holy Spirit from the Watchtower of 1992, May 1st, pages 19 through 23. Keep awake in the time of the end. We're told this, quote, It was with good reason that Jesus said that Jehovah's day will be instantly upon us as a snare. A snare is often equipped with a noose, and it is used for capturing birds and mammals. The snare has a trigger, and anyone who walks into it trips the trigger. The snare then pulls shut, and the victim is caught. All of this happens very suddenly. In like manner, Jesus said, spiritually inactive ones will be surprised and will be overtaken in God's day of fury. Why keep awake? Because this is the most perilous time in human history. For Christians to give in to spiritual drowsiness at this time would be disastrous. If we become complacent or allow our hearts to be weighed down with the anxieties of life, we will be in danger. 
At Luke 21, 34 and 35, Jesus Christ warned us, pay attention to yourselves that your hearts never become weighed down with overeating and heavy drinking and anxieties of life. And suddenly that day be instantly upon you as a snare for it will come in upon all those dwelling upon the face of all the earth, end quote. And it's always a good time to start our time together by quoting from the faithful and discreet slave ad nauseum. But again, can you feel it? Wow. With the world ending any second now, suddenly, like a thief, catching people in traps. It's no surprise then that the governing body doesn't want anyone to waste any remaining seconds pursuing things like a college education. It won't be needed in paradise where you will pass every day for eternity petting animals, growing the perfect pomegranates, and, well, maybe as they told us in the 80s, exploring outer space. It's all in print. But with Armageddon about to break loose any second now, you certainly do not need to pursue a career or give any thought to your finances or making money. That would be a waste of time. You won't need it. Everyone will be sharing everything post-Armageddon. So there is no need for anyone bravely listening to invest in your future. Money is a nothing burger. Would you like an inspiring example of what we can look forward to? From the awake of 1987, August 22nd, pages 11 through 15, this series, Sacrifices Bring Rich Rewards, we get an experience from a young sister who tells us this. Quote, I also enjoyed studying and as a result received high scholastic merits. However, when I decided against a university education in favor of using my full time in the preaching work, I was taken before the vocational guidance officer. It seems such a waste, he said, as he tried to persuade me to pursue a medical career. Yet, I have never regretted my decision. After leaving school, I worked for a year and a half in the new computer section of a government department. When I handed in my resignation, I was offered double salary and head position in that department. This was a tempting offer, especially for a 17-year-old. But I stuck to my goal and began the full-time ministry as a regular pioneer on, uh, oh no, on June 1st, 1966, end quote. <laughs> wow. I wonder how all of these decisions worked out for the sister in this article whose experience cannot be corroborated. If I'm doing my math correctly, she is now 75 years old in 2024. She bailed on being a good student. She bailed in helping others and mankind with a career in medicine as a doctor. And then she bailed on a computer job at 17. All of it in favor of handing out books for the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society that, incidentally, those same books are all now, well, how do I put this? They're all now old light and out of publication. But what an experience. She sure set an incredible example, right? She knew the end of this world was imminent and armed with that knowledge she made decisions that changed her life. You might be asking, what the heck is he talking about? Why am I bringing all of this up? Because it makes what Jesus' most recent move via the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, well, all that more curious. 
In fairness to the nine most important men on earth, located in upstate New York, maybe their designer watches have stopped working or they need new batteries. In fairness to them, because they seem to have lost track of time. Despite JW Broadcasting episodes telling all of us we're in the last day of the last days of the last days of the last days of the last day, Jesus is making business decisions. And he's making those business decisions just seconds from killing everyone on this planet that isn't a baptized Jehovah's Witness. And I'm here to tell you that this is all very odd timing. But the king is not only protecting his financial assets here on earth, allegedly, but he is looking to grow. That's right, grow his current financial portfolio. Even as we can picture him huddling up there in heaven with Charles Taze Russell, Judge Joe, and the Apostle Peter as they outline his plan to destroy all the rest of us. Nonetheless, as we have learned in the last week or two, Jesus has turned his attention to his finances here on earth. What am I talking about? I'm a little late to the game after being out for a week. But if you haven't heard, the Irish independent news website and media company released an article on August 27th titled, Former top UBS executive joins Jehovah's Witnesses' new Ireland-based asset venture. That's right. There was no flash from heaven or even a like announcement on the website. Most JWs won't know this. I wonder why. But nonetheless, in what many consider a bombshell article, Jehovah's Witnesses have opened three, three new asset management companies in the country of Ireland to, well, manage Jesus' earthly assets. The same guy, I know you're thinking it, that same guy, the Son of God, that said the following at Matthew chapter 8 and verse 20 of the New World Translation. Quote, but Jesus said to them, foxes have dens and birds of heaven have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay down his head. End quote. Yeah, this was well before he was a real estate magnet. What a change. The humble carpenter we find in the Bible has gone from nowhere to live to massive multi-billionaire business mogul. He may have had nothing on earth, but he changed all of that. You see, he changed all of that as soon as he got to heaven and he became, well, the king of Jehovah's Witnesses in 1914. Who could have guessed that the very man that we can read to this day was, was busy washing his apostles' dirty feet and doing any number of other things, would eventually become an invisible tycoon, including three new companies to manage his assets on a planet he plans on destroying any second now. <laughs> I have to tell you, I don't think anyone saw this coming. Did you? I didn't see this coming. In fact, the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses has been telling us things like the following, to be sure that we, lowly humans, don't put too much effort into being successful business people. From the Watchtower Study Edition of July 2017, page 7, paragraph 2, quote, Jesus understood that the current economic system would not change until God's kingdom comes. Along with the political and religious element, the greedy commercial system represented by the merchants of Revelation 18.3, wait a minute, it, it says there, quote, constitutes part of Satan's world, end quote, 
wait a minute, R does it? In paragraph 12 of the same article, it says, quote, another way to gain friendship with Jehovah is by minimizing our involvement with the commercial world. You remember, they just said it was owned by Satan and, quote, using our circumstances to seek true riches. The Watchtower article in paragraph 16 concludes with this, quote, Jesus said, when such unrighteous riches fail, not if they fail, bank and economic collapses that have occurred in these last days are insignificant when compared with what will happen on a world scale in the near future. Satan's entire system, political, religious, and commercial, is destined to fail. The prophets Ezekiel and Zephaniah foretold that gold and silver, staples of the commercial world, through the centuries will become worthless. End quote. Wow. Jesus has just opened three new asset management companies to grow his portfolio. We've been told by the same Jesus through the governing body that this is part of Satan's greedy commercial system and that it will definitely fail when the same guy who just invested in it, Jesus Christ, wipes it out. Apparently, Jesus has had a major change of heart. And again, if you're new here, I say Jesus because we are told by the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, he is their boss. Maybe we should call him CEO. He is running the show through the nine of them. What a change of heart. He now apparently has a deep interest in protecting his financial assets here on earth. You know, in the system Satan runs. The fact that Jesus is directing the governing body to set up three asset-based management companies should strike any and every Jehovah's Witness that is listening as incredibly odd. When I see stuff like this, it strikes me and hits me the same way upon the discovery that Jehovah's Witnesses were part of the United Nations and weren't telling anyone. This is shocking stuff. It's unbelievable to see the king opening up asset-based management companies on a planet he plans on wiping out. And remember that Jesus was the same guy that said this, and Matthew chapter 19 and verse 21 of the New World Translation. He said, quote, Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go sell your belongings and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come be my follower. End quote. I got to tell you, I've read that many times, as no doubt many of you had, and that sounds like an easy plan to follow. Sell everything you got and give it to those in need. Give to the poor. Well, I guess with this news, except for your stock portfolio. Keep that for yourself and grow it in three new asset companies. Jesus has always been a big investor. Remember, you can read it in the Bible for yourself. You'll find that in the Bible at 1 Nasdaq chapter 1. <laughs> Jesus has always been a big investor. Well, not really. I encourage everyone to go read this article by the Irish-based media company. I will post a link. Most especially if you are a Jehovah's Witness who is currently donating your own money to God's organization. Because, well, there's no easy way to say this. Jesus, again, is directing the nine guys in New York on how to invest your donated money. Like, how can we wrap our heads around this? Tell me you're crooked without telling me you're crooked. Your donated money is being used and counted as an asset by this organization reinvested, shifted around, and on the path to growth, all in the benefit of the nine kings in New York. 
But maybe you're sitting here thinking, wait a minute, ah, this seems like a reach. Perhaps you're someone who isn't familiar with what an asset management company is, much less having to make three of them as the governing body just did. Allow me to share. From Investopedia, asset management company, definition and example, we are told an asset management company is this, quote, an asset management company is a firm that invests pooled funds from clients, putting the capital to work through different investments, including stocks, bonds, real estate, master limited partnerships, and more. Along with high net worth individual portfolios, AMCs manage hedge funds and pension plans, and to better serve smaller investors, create pooled structures such as mutual funds, index funds, or exchange traded funds, which they can manage in a single centralized portfolio. In most cases, I'm sorry, I just, this is so unbelievable. In back to the quote, in most cases, AMCs charge a fee that is calculated as a percentage of the client's total AUM. This asset management fee is a defined annual percentage that is calculated and paid monthly. For example, if an asset management company charges a 1% annual fee, it would charge $100,000 in annual fees to manage a portfolio worth $10 million, end quote. Let me be the first to tell you, the Jehovah's Witness organization has billions of dollars. And now they have three new asset management companies shifting that money around, investing, pushing into pension plans, and taking what they called your pooled money, donated money, to grow it in the benefit of the organization. And now, allow me to read directly from the article that being the article from the Irish Media Company. Let's break down, as we move forward today, King Jesus and Jehovah's Witnesses' latest earthly move. From the article, quote, The Jehovah's Witnesses religious group has established a new asset management firm in Ireland that features a slate of heavy-hitting directors, including the former chief risk officer at Swiss banking giant UBS and other seasoned investment bankers. Note this. The experienced financial directors are all understood to also have ties to the religious movement. End quote. Paragraph one of the bombshell article announcing Jesus' new three asset management companies. Wow. When I first read this, I wondered if these heavy hitters from the banking industry were also chosen by Holy Spirit. Doesn't it seem like that would be a reasonable question? They're managing Jesus' assets, the same Jesus who had none when he first made a trip here to earth. I'm guessing they were chosen by Holy Spirit? Are the elders in their local congregations? Were these guys getting the national average in field service or in book cart management? No one knows. No one knows. But this organization that discourages a college education is currently leaning into highly educated financiers to manage Jesus' assets here on the earth he's about to wipe out. The article continues, and as if most of us didn't already know, you may want to buckle your seatbelt as the Irish Independent is about to share some rather large financial numbers. Numbers that any Jehovah's Witness you approach today will have zero knowledge of. But that isn't all the fun. 
take a closer look at what they named their three new asset management companies in Ireland. After all, we remember those service meeting parts with brother lower than national average or sister flaky pioneer. Remember the stupid names they would use? They're still getting cute. Notice the name of the three asset companies. Quote, the religious group is thought to have tens of billions of dollars in assets and relies on anonymous donations from its members to support all of its activities. It has established three companies in Ireland in recent weeks, including Mina Asset Management, Mina Treasury Services, and Lepta Payment Solutions. All three are based at the community's Irish headquarters in County Wicklow, end quote. Let it sink in. Tens of billions of dollars. Jehovah's Witnesses? Same people? They have tens of billions of dollars? You don't say. Now, where would God's organization get tens of billions of dollars? I think we all know the answer, and so did this reporter. Donations from members, from publishers, from people associated with Jehovah's Witnesses. You remember scraping together some cash to drop into the donation box at the Kingdom Hall. The money you and I earned and then gave to support our local congregation. All those Kingdom Hall bills and more. The same money that is then sent to upstate New York to allegedly support the organization's activities worldwide. You know, things like preaching efforts or building projects. And uh, as we now know, financial investments. The same money the governing body claims they never ask for, we never pass a plate, is the same governing body that set up ATMs in assembly halls here in America. How do they get hardworking people, including the poor, and those living in poverty in some countries, to give them their precious money? Just visit their website. Watch the many videos. Read their publications. Attend a meeting or one of their conventions. All of them feature manipulative messaging designed to get you to part with your cash. And the messages to give them your money extends to our children who are encouraged in little cute videos to part with their ice cream money in order to uh, add to Jesus' portfolio and his asset management companies. The organization led by the humble carpenter of the Bible who didn't even have a home has gone on the offensive, folks, by creating many ways for you to donate your cash, everything from writing checks to apps for your credit cards. You can use PayPal if you're a witness. You can give them your real estate. You can include the organization in your last will and testament and make them the beneficiaries of your own insurance policies. It's all on the website, of course, powered by Holy Spirit. But as if that wasn't enough to pad the governing body's bank account and create a need for a diversified asset management portfolio, one needs to only look closely at their real estate empire. How about just a couple of examples? Just a couple. Again, neither of which will be known by any Jehovah's Witness you ask about this. Feel free to call a relative if they're not shunning you. Ask one at a book card. None of them will know this stuff. In 2016, their buildings in Columbia Heights, including a nearby parking lot on 85 J Street, some of us will know where that was, were sold for a massive $1 billion. This is all a matter of public record, folks. This isn't mentally diseased apostates on the internet. You feel free to access the public records. 
But Jesus, when he's on an investing spree, didn't stop there. In 2018, his spiritual leaders here on earth sold one of its prime apartment blocks in Brooklyn to a private equity firm for $202 million. And let me be the first to tell you there is so much more. Dive into this. You can make yourself sick just daydreaming on what they made from all that waterfront property in the former Brooklyn Bethel. Only to turn around and build a number of state-of-the-art facilities in upstate New York. Tens of billions of dollars. God's organization in the last days. But how about that clever use of minus? No doubt leaning into Jesus' illustration found in Luke 19. I mean, if you're going to do an asset management company, you got to make it spiritual, right? It's an excellent story there in Luke 19 about being entrusted with Jesus' assets. But, well, let's let the governing body tell us in their own words what Luke 19 means. From the Greatest Man book, chapter 100, the illustration of the minas is the title of the chapter. We're told this from the faithful slave, quote, The silver minas are valuable pieces of money, each amounting to about three months' wages for an agricultural worker. But what do the minas represent? And what kind of business are the slaves to do with them? The minas represent assets that spirit-begotten disciples could make use of in producing more heirs of the heavenly kingdom until Jesus coming as king in the promised kingdom. After his resurrection and appearance to his disciples, he gave them the symbolic minas for making more disciples and thus adding to the kingdom of heaven class. End quote. <laughs> Wait a minute. Do we have a learning disability here? He wasn't telling them to set up three asset management companies to grow his portfolio of an estimated tens of billions of dollars. That's not what that illustration's about. And you know it. The illustration was actually about taking Jesus' assets, that being human capital, and growing them so more people could go to heaven. It wasn't about money. Wait a minute, you already knew that? <laughs> you can't make it up. You just can't make it up. And where I try to stay away from this stuff, I've just never seen such a collection of morons in my life. All of this in print, and all of it completely missing for a Jehovah's Witness. They're not paying attention. And then there was the very spiritual move of naming one of Jesus' asset management companies Lepta. You remember that, right? You remember what a Lepta is. From the Watchtower of 1976, August 15th, page 512, questions from the readers, my kind of people. The question is, how much was the widow's might? Quote, Jesus Christ once saw a needy widow dropping two mites into a temple treasury chest. According to the original Greek text, each of these mites was a lepton, the smallest Jewish copper coin of that time. According to the original Greek text, each of these mites was a lepton, and I already said that, the Jewish copper coin of the time, <laughs> repeating myself. Her contribution of two lepta amounted to a mere six... Oh boy, I am butchering this. Let me back up. Her contribution of two lepta amounted to a mere 64th of a day's wage. For this small sum, a person might be able to buy half a sparrow, not enough for even one meal, end quote. I, my immediate thought is, how did that work? You cut a sparrow in half? I mean, it <laughs> doesn't seem very, uh, very practical. Nonetheless, the point is what she was giving and how much it was worth. And how clever, how clever by the governing body. Let's name one of our asset management companies, Lepta. This is sure to distract those publishers in third world countries from the fact that Lepta payment solutions 
just might be the governing body's way of bringing, and I'm not kidding, credit card payment processing in-house thereby avoiding the transaction fees of processing credit cards online, you know, via their website. Not kidding. Lepta Payment Solutions may just be their effort to erase the money they're losing in processing credit cards via jdub.org. <laughs> you see, when you're getting people to part with money for your asset management company, Get them thinking they're just like the widow, dropping in two small coins. Hey, I got an idea. We can call the company Lepta. They'll never see it coming. But why stop now? The article continues with a rundown of the spiritually qualified men that Jesus was no doubt referring to in his illustration in Luke 19, right? I think it's important to read this if you haven't seen it, please go read this article for yourself. It seems like a lot, but I'm going to share anyway. What goes through your mind as you hear the rundown on the guys in control of Jesus' money? The article says this, quote, The directors of Mina Asset Management include three U.S.-based directors and others based in Germany and Australia. One of the directors is Philip Lofts. He worked for UBS in the United States for three decades and was the group chief risk officer from 2009 to 2010 and from 2012 to 2015. He also served as CEO of UBS Americas in 2011. He was a non-executive director of UBS Group Americas from 2017 until 2023. He is currently a non-executive board member of major Swiss private banking group EFG International. On to the next fella. Vasilios Papas, with an address in Germany, is also a director of Mina Asset Management. He is the co-founder and managing director of leading global asset management firm, Asnagon Asset Management. It has about 57 billion pounds of assets under management. The next guy, Tobias Brolight, is currently an adjunct professor, wait, college? At Germany's for-profit IU International University of Applied Sciences, and lists his address in New York at the Jehovah's Witnesses' property. He worked for German banking giant Sparkase as a portfolio manager from 2007 to 2009 and also held other roles at the group. One more, actually two, Nolan Vengadasami is also a director. Forgive me if I butchered your name, Nolan. He worked as a bond trader with ABN AMRO from 1997 to 2001. He also worked for South Africa's Standard Bank Group. And finally, our last guy, another director of Mina Asset Management is New Zealander Stuart Bull, who gave his address as the headquarters of the Jehovah's Witnesses in Australia. <sighs> Weren't these guys special pioneering? What do you mean they went to college? What? Awkward, huh? Managing some of the largest asset management portfolios on earth. In university. In board groups. Odd, huh? How you feeling if you're a pioneer who lives with three other people? who can't fix a flat tire but needs to make their time. And yeah, I'm going there. Because that's really what this is about, isn't it? Did we ever get a resume like this from Jesus from the Bible on how to manage assets? If we did, I don't recall. Point me to it. The article continues. It says just straight, straight away, the Jehovah's Witness office in the UK was asked for a comment and I must say, end quote, it looks like they didn't respond. I wonder why. But the article then goes on to say this, quote, 
There are about 8.8 .8 million Jehovah's Witnesses in the world and an estimated 8,000 across the island of Ireland. About 1.2 million are in the United States. It has amassed considerable assets since the movement was founded in Pittsburgh in 1872 by Charles Taze Russell. In 2015, it put its worldwide headquarters in Brooklyn, New York, up for sale in various lots. It was expected to fetch as much as $1 billion as the group planned to move to upstate New York. In 2018, the group sold the last of the properties it owned in Brooklyn, it bringing to 37 the total number of properties it sold in the borough since 2004. In 2018, just one of the apartment blocks it sold in Brooklyn fetched $202 million when it was sold to Florida-based private equity firm Kane Anderson Real Estate, end quote. Wow. Am I the only one first, uh, first thought here, who remembers when the criteria for being a leadership, in a leadership position in this organization was, I don't know, based on spiritual qualifications? I, who, how many of us remember 1 Timothy 3? Remember that one? I reread it and, well, there just isn't any mention of being a bond trader, a portfolio manager, or a banking executive, or a guy on a board at a university. I missed it. But I guess it all makes sense. When it comes to handling Jesus' money, you actually want someone that's educated. When it comes to protecting children from pedophiles or navigating people's mental health issues or just making sure the Kingdom Hall toilet gets cleaned, well, those people, they fall under what's called spiritual qualifications, you know, along with a couple of angels and a big dose of Holy Spirit. That's how those guys get appointed. But those guys don't get appointed to handle Jesus' cash. That's a different gig. Despite all that stuff being invisible, it requires spiritual qualifications. Managing the org's money? Well, no, those resumes require educated guys like the four or five I just read off to you. And if you're a Jehovah's Witness listening to this and you're not shocked, I really don't have much more I can say. But if you're not yet bored, or in some cases, in just livid, the article here in the Irish Media Company ends on this note. <laughs> it says, quote, Among the well-known Jehovah's Witnesses are tennis champion Serena Williams, who was baptized by the group in Florida last year. The religious group is thought to have tens of billions of dollars in assets and relies on donations, end quote. A couple of things here. Whether you like it or not, it looks like Serena Williams has become the face of the organization, even as she lights the Olympic torch or goes to the nutcracker play with her kids. The latest celebrity to embrace the truth and such an old nugget, isn't it? It's. <laughs> Are they insinuating she is financially supporting Jehovah's Witnesses, by the way, here? They mention her, then they mention they have tens of billions of dollars, and it all comes through donations. No clue. Just a mention of her, and then it all concludes with reiterating that Jesus' assets here on earth, on the planet that he is about to wipe clean, and is led by, I don't know, I guess the chief financial officer, Satan the devil, and his little brother, that, that they're all worth tens of billions of dollars. And I've got to say at this point, 2024, among Jehovah's Witnesses, has been one hell of a year, hasn't it? Would you agree? We got beards for the guys. We got slacks for the girls. Everyone gets to mark and shun people at will now. They were given permission to do it, you know, wherever they see fit, you know, absolving and washing their hands of, you know, any problems the governing body might have. And they showed us that the world rulers in some of their illustrations all get together to discuss what to do about the highly scary nine powerful men 
in upstate New York that represent Jehovah's Witnesses. And if those changes didn't keep Jesus and his nine favorite kings busy enough, now we come to learn in late August that they're setting up asset management companies. For anyone that has been around for 20 years or more, do you even recognize this religion anymore? It's incredible. And to see them emphasize the answer to the question, where is all this money coming from? Uh, To know that it's coming from maybe you, maybe someone else that you know, donating this money. Does it then naturally lead to the question, does every investor, because look, if you're donating money to Jehovah's Witnesses, let's be frank here, you are an investor in Jesus' asset management portfolio. You're an investor. Does every investor, uh, sorry, does every publisher, do they see a return on investment? What are you making out of this, dear Jehovah's Witness? From the Watchtower of 2015, September 1st, page 6, under the aptly titled article, How is our ministry financed? Well, here's what you get if you're a, quote, investor, sorry, publisher. Quote, each year, we print and distribute hundreds of millions of Bibles and pieces of Bible literature. We build and operate branch offices and printeries around the world. Tens of thousands of congregations meet in modest yet attractive places of worship called Kingdom Halls. Who pays for all of this? Our work is supported entirely by voluntary donations. End quote. Watchtower 2015, September 1st, page 6. So wait a minute. People are voluntarily giving the governing body money for uh, this literature? For the literature, for the right to go to a kingdom hall, for the printeries that you print the literature on. And I got to tell you, that creates a few questions. But just one more point of emphasis on the source of money currently locked up in these three new asset management companies. One more point to emphasize here on how deep tapping into your money goes. From Jehovah's Witnesses, Proclaimers of God's Kingdom, pages 345 and 346, they tell us this, quote, The work of the organization is not maintained by donations of a group of wealthy donors. Please pay special attention. Quote, Most of the contributions are from individuals who have only moderate means. Many of them, very little of this world's goods. Included are young children who want to share in this way in supporting the kingdom work. End quote. In their own words. Most of the money that this organization has has been built on the backs of those with little means. They said it, not me. Including people living on the poverty line, single parents, and who wouldn't be proud of telling the world as they just did that they take their money from young children, from kids. Imagine being proud of taking money from poor people and kids. Did they even proofread this? Did they even have anybody in that room who said, "Eh, that might not be a great idea to point that out. Do they even proofread this stuff? Or maybe this was written to guilt a reader 
a Jehovah's Witness into feeling bad for not giving their money like all the other poor folks or even little kids. It is stunning in what may be a 90-second read from the media company in Ireland what they've just exposed, what this organization is truly about. If you're a Jehovah's Witness that donates, the organization is investing your money as they see fit. They gave you the name of the guys that are making the decisions. Why? To give back to you or to help you in a time of need? Is that where this money goes? No. To grow uh, their own asset portfolio. It's growing at such a rate that they needed to set up three new companies and gave them clever Bible names. A Jehovah's Witness never sees that or their money ever again. They have sold them on appreciating their juvenile literature as a return on investment for the money they give them. I'm sure we all remember that story that inspired the names of these three new asset management companies, the story of the widow's mite. We talked about it. Remember when Jesus saw her give those two small coins and then instructed the apostles to grab the money out of the box and reinvest it? Remember that? What do you mean? You don't? You don't remember that. He commended her for giving what little bit she had. She was clearly on the poverty line, and it was important to him to mention she was a widow. She was struggling, folks. She gave those two small coins, and Jesus instructed the apostles to go over there, grab what she dropped in the box, and let's reinvest. Let's make that money grow on a planet I soon plan to destroy. Once free from this religion, it's staggering to realize that you ever supported this stuff. And do I need to point out the greatest irony of all? Using just what they explain to us? It's this. You and I pay for the very literature that they give us and tell us it's a return on our investment. And we walk away from all of it feeling like it's a gift from Jesus Christ and that we're being cared for spiritually with proper food at the proper time. We paid for it. <laughs> we paid for them to give us this literature. It's the kind of thing that a witness never thinks about. They don't spend five seconds dwelling on. But let's not forget yet another source of income for these guys. We all know where this is going. Younger Jehovah's Witnesses may not remember this. But there was a time when we were also asked for money from the very, we would ask for money, I should say, from the very people that we were trying to save from Armageddon. We also asked them to give us money in the Kingdom Ministry of May 2009, page 3, make good use of our publications, the ones we paid for, we get this, quote, keep in mind that we are the ones primarily responsible for the financial coverage of these valuable tools in our ministry. When leaving a publication with interested ones, do not hesitate to inform them of the privilege they have to support the worldwide work with their donation, end quote. <laughs> you see, you're not even a Jehovah's Witness, but it's a privilege for you to give us your money. Did anyone else hate this as much as I did? I hated this as a kid. Asking for a nickel or a quarter, and then, if you give me that, if you give me some money, then we will save your life with this really cool magazine and the article I just told you about. Or how about the irony of asking people for their money after interrupting their day to share literature 
that featured messages like this. The Watchtower of 2001, February 15th, page 14, where it tells us, quote, In fact, with God's day of judgment so near today, all the world should keep silent before the sovereign Lord Jehovah and hear what he says through the little flock of Jesus' anointed followers and their companions, his other sheep. And here's the message, quote, Annihilation awaits all who will not listen and who thereby set themselves against rule by God's kingdom, end quote. And there it is. I'm here to deliver a message. And it's getting late in this one, so I got to say a message just like my favorite guy Noah did before Jehovah drowned everyone. He made it. We're here to deliver a message. The message is that you better listen to me and take this Watchtower magazine I want to hand you or annihilation awaits you. Okay, but, but as you take this magazine, also give me your money. It's a privilege. The governing body told me to tell you that. It's a privilege for you to donate to this arrangement. And now a Jehovah's Witness can add their money to the money they personally may donate, and it will all go, as of 2024, to Jesus' new asset management portfolio, where he can reinvest it. If you're keeping track at home, to summarize, here's a magazine. It tells me I'm right, you're wrong, you better listen, or you're going to die. Give me some money for that, and please read the magazine. I'll be back next week with another one. It's just an unbelievable system set up almost a century ago by Judge Joe Rutherford, for the most part, that most Jehovah's Witnesses never think about as they twist around the block in a minivan, drinking their Starbucks, eating a scone, praying no one's home because they really don't have answers anyway. It's an incredible system. And we can see where it ends up. All of this is done under the radar, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, with little to no Jehovah's Witness even knowing what's going on. They don't even understand what's happening. I know that's ironic, but there's nothing shady here, right? If you're a witness, you donate money to help your brothers in a war-torn land. You know they're starving or they're without shelter, but well, hey, your money gets funneled through their internal financial system with the understanding that it's all done transparently. They'll take the money. You can't send it to Brother Jones, who's starving in a faraway country. Nope, send it to us. We'll run it now through apparently three of our new asset management companies. And eh, hopefully Brother Jones will get a meal tonight. They claim that Jehovah's Witnesses understand this. They claim everyone knows what's going on financially. But is that really true? When you look back in your time as a witness, did you understand really the depth of their financial infrastructure? Check out their claim here in the Watchtower of 1994, September 1st, page 18, where we're told to rejoice in Jehovah. Quote, and this is a footnote to the article, at assemblies and once a month in congregations, a brief statement is read indicating the amount of voluntary contributions received as well as the expenses incurred. Occasionally, letters are sent out advising how such donations are being used. Underline the word occasionally. <laughs> Back to the quote, everyone is thus... Oh, I want to hammer this home. Quote, everyone is thus reminded of the financial situation of the worldwide work of Jehovah's Witnesses, end quote. Folks, there's their claim. Everyone's kept abreast of this. It's very transparent. Uh, occasionally, we'll let them know what's going on, but everyone knows what's going on. With that said, feel free, as I said earlier, to ask any Jehovah's Witness how they feel about their three new asset management companies in Ireland. Approach one. Ask them how they feel about it. I feel very confident in saying that most of them will have no clue what you're talking about. 
and will immediately think you're a mentally diseased apostate designing conversations to trip them up. Since none of those contributing to Jehovah's Witnesses get a return on their investment outside of a new book or Caleb and Sophia video, aside from that stuff, which, uh, of course, I want to say ironically, they're then required to study, and in the very literature that's given to them for the money that they handed over, uh, will also tell them to give more money uh, so that they can make more of this magazine, which will tell them to give them more money. That th The next question is, who is benefiting? from these asset management companies. <laughs> they assure us, by the way, that no one is. Yeah. They assure us that no one is benefiting from these asset management companies. Are you ready for this? From Jehovah's Witnesses, Proclaimers of God's Kingdom, pages 350 and 351, the big, heavy, dark green book, it says this, quote, no financial profit is made by any members of the governing body, officers of its legal agencies, or other prominent persons associated with the organization as a result of the work of Jehovah's Witnesses. Those who are accepted for special full-time service at the world headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses all subscribe to a vow of poverty as have all the members of the governing body and all the other members of the Bethel family there. This does not mean that they live a drab life without any comforts, but it does mean that they share, without partiality, the modest provisions of food, shelter, and expense reimbursement that are made for all in such service. End quote. Wait a minute. <laughs> no, it couldn't be them, right? No way the governing body, its legal agencies, or other prominent persons, as they say, are benefiting from the money that flows through. They're not at all. For a Jehovah's Witness apologist listening, they just told you that the governing body and everyone else with a title in the organization have all, quote, subscribed to a vow of of poverty and that they get by with quote modest provisions poverty poverty do they understand the definition of the word poverty the new headquarters by the way is located on a 253 acre forested plot in warwick new york and includes the following Four residential buildings, a waste separation facility, a vehicle maintenance building, administrative offices, a commercial grade kitchen, a laundry, and even an infirmary. Did I mention it's on a, quote, modest 253 acres of forested land complete with ponds? I mean, this is truly very modest. And this gives all new meaning to taking, quote, a vow of poverty. I'm sure the brothers and sisters in developing lands need some new light because I got to tell you, those poor folks in third world countries who are loyal to this organization, their view of poverty is dramatically different from the guys in upstate New York living on a 253-acre high-end resort compound. That is one hell of a look at their definition of poverty. From the Watchtower of December 15th, page 15, paragraph 14, will you make sacrifices for the kingdom, we're told this, quote, Many live in areas where hardships or poverty are the order of the day. Pay special attention to this, quote, our organization endeavors to offset the deficiency of our brothers who live in such countries, end quote. And I quickly move from laughter to anger. Do they? Is that how these three new asset management companies are going to operate? 
offsetting the deficiencies of brothers in developing countries who, by the way, gave you the very money that you're telling us you would then give back to them to offset their poverty? Does anybody else have a migraine? They're insulting people to their very faces. But in that same article from the Watchtower of 2013, just a few sentences later in paragraph 15 says this, quote, in one very poor country in Africa, some brothers mark off a small section of their garden and use the funds from the sale of the produce from that section to support the kingdom work. In that same country, a building project was scheduled for a much needed kingdom hall. The local brothers and sisters wanted to assist. However, the project was to be undertaken in the middle of the planting season. Still, determined to have a share, they worked on the Kingdom Hall project during the day and then went into the fields in the evening to make sure that they got their crops planted. What a self-sacrificing spirit, end quote. When I first read this, I laughed. And then I thought, my God, they just insult people to their face. But this should really anger people. These folks that they're propping up, who just sense ago said that they endeavor to offset their deficiencies, they then prop up. By the way, did you note they're living in poverty? Real poverty. And I've reread these two paragraphs where you claim the organization offsets any deficiency for those that are really living in poverty. But uh, would you look at that? They then just sentences later go on to share how these same people living in poverty are working day and night just to be able to eat and build a new kingdom hall uh, where you could then ask these same people weekly to donate more of their uh, money. Where in this story did you do anything for them to offset their deficiency? It infuriates me. And a Jehovah's Witness in the United States who doesn't have to worry about working day and night just to have food and then send part of the food to New York so those guys can build three new asset companies. It, these people are just glossed over by a witness because it doesn't impact them in developed countries. But just remember, the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, hey folks, they have taken a vow of poverty. Insulting doesn't cover it anymore. This should anger people. People are being taken advantage of. People are starving. People are going without. And they're still sending money to the guys in New York who are claiming they're in poverty. But enough of all this. The clock is ticking. We are running out of time. Any second now, this generation may just suddenly stop overlapping with the last one. With the very last second of the last day of the last day of the critical last days uh, suddenly coming to a fiery end. But despite that fact, Jesus Christ of the Bible and current King of Jehovah's Witnesses is investing in the future by setting up three new asset management companies in Ireland. The governing body has really painted a fascinating picture of the king, haven't they? In Matthew chapter 24, incidentally a chapter of the Bible that they claim is all about them too, none of us probably noticed that we actually got a preview of Jesus, the investor. In Matthew 24, 1 of the New World Translation, it says, quote, Now as Jesus was departing from the temple, his disciples approached to show him the buildings of the temple. End quote. Nice job, apostles. They clearly knew that one day Jesus would include real estate in his asset portfolio. But it's what he says later in that same chapter that really resonates with me. 
In Matthew 24, verses 42 and 43 of the New World Translation, Jesus says, quote, Keep on the watch, therefore, because you do not know what day your Lord is coming. End quote. Huh. It looks like Jesus and the governing body have some inside information, etc. trading. Based on him setting up, well, three new asset-based financial companies here on the earth. And when I read that and read this latest news, I walked away with one thought. I guess by investing in the future, he knows he won't be coming back here for a while. I want to thank you for joining me this week. If you are a Jehovah's Witness, please put your checkbook away. And wherever you may be, be well. Thank you.